Good morning, everyone. And a very warm welcome to you this morning. Thank you for joining us either here in the sanctuary or online, uh, either live just now or indeed uh, on catch-up as the week goes on. Uh, You'll have seen from the news sheet, and we'll perhaps remember from last Sunday, that there's no tea after the service this morning because there is a sponsored bounce going on at the moment in the hall with the children of the creche, the Sunday school, the Bible class. They're all through there frantically bouncing up and down, having a great time. There's one large bouncy castle and three small ones for the wee ones as well, so hopefully they'll have a terrific time. If you haven't sponsored them and you'd like to do so, then maybe just see either Anne Brown or one of the Sunday School leaders after the service this morning. The money is really to support the work that the Sunday School does during the course of the year. A couple of other things, uh, just to kind of keep you up to date with what's happening. Um, this morning, there were some extra large print copies of the hymn words and of the news items. And we've been conscious that some people um, find either what we've produced already or the screens, maybe not just the best for them. So if you need an extra large print copy, then ask for it each week when you come in, um, and the, the welcome team will give you that. Also, if you're following online and you would like us to email that to you, then just let us know by either phoning or emailing the office. That'd be really helpful. Our student minister, Stuart Love, is leading worship in Airdrie this morning in Flower Hill Parish Church, where I've agreed to be interim moderator in their vacancy. So Stuart's there um, this morning filling the pulpit, and then next Sunday we will exchange responsibilities. He'll be here to conduct the all-age service, and I'll be there to preach the charge vacant. Please pray for Stuart this morning, and I would really appreciate your prayers over this next period of time as I try to help and support the folks in Airdrie. Uh, Next week, as well as the all-age worship service, there there won't be a creche, so all of the children will be in here. But if there's any of the parents are conscious that the, the, the kids are a bit restless or whatever, there will be toys laid out still in the small hall, so you can take them through at any point during the service, if you choose to do so. Um, There were some leaflets at the front door this morning. Um, You maybe picked one up on your way in, or you can on your way out if you haven't already seen it. There's a consultation going on in the future shape of our town centre here in Motherwell between next Sunday the 21st and Thursday the 25th of June. Uh, It's focused in Glow Centre, but various things that are happening And there's information on this leaflet if you'd like to pick one up. I think it's important that uh, we who worship here and serve in the town centre have some input to this. And certainly my wife and I who live here in the town centre on what is essentially a traffic island will be having some input to the consultation. Uh, Don't be put off by the name. It's called Charette Plus. Sounds awfully fancy, doesn't it? I'm told that it was uh, as a result of the funding that they got that they needed to call it this. Um, it's some French thing. I don't know. But anyway, that's what it's called. And then finally, just to say, um, there's a wee bit in the notices from Elizabeth and Wilson Devlin to say thanks to folks in the congregation who have prayed for their wee grandson, Drew. And if you've read it already, you'll have seen that Drew has now been discharged after his heart transplant operation. And we got a lovely card at the kit session on Thursday night. And I don't think there was a dry eye in the house as we rejoiced at just how things have worked out for Drew and for the family. So we give thanks to those who prayed. And most of all, we give thanks to Almighty God for those who have used their skills in such a tremendous way at this time. Plenty of news items there for you to read. This morning I started to read my way through what are called the Songs of Ascents. Uh, Psalms 120 up to about 135. And I read these words and I want to share them with you this morning as we lead into our worship service. Psalm 120. I call on the Lord in my distress and He answers me. Let's worship God in our opening hymn, 
number 112 from the hymn book, God whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. Hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. (coughs) Loving God, this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice in all the good things which surround us in our lives, our homes and our families, our friends, our church, the vastness of the universe and the beauty of the natural world the sights and sounds which greet us every morning as we rise from our beds. We thank you for all of the interest and the opportunities, the pleasures which each day brings. We thank you for the love of Christ which encircles us, His Holy Spirit who guides us, and your eternal purpose which constantly inspires us to go on with our lives. We thank you for this day, this special day, the Lord's day, set aside so that we might praise you, so that we might bring our lives before you and make holy every day to your service. Loving God, we bring you our praise gladly and reverently. We declare your greatness. We acknowledge your faithfulness. We rejoice in your goodness. All we have All that we are, we owe to you. And you are ever at work in our lives and in our world, striving to help, to strengthen, to heal, to comfort, to forgive and restore, to undo wrongs, and to establish that which is right. Loving God, forgive us that we have sometimes lost sight of your great love that we've been forgetful of you, greeting some days with indifference, even reluctance, 
instead of welcoming them as your gift to us. We have failed at times to count our blessings and appreciate just how fortunate we really are. Loving God, we know that we've failed you in so much. We've not always given you due recognition. We've not always been as thankful as we ought to be. At times we don't live as you require us to. Yet we pray that you will have mercy on us. That you will cleanse us from all our weakness, our frailty, our waywardness. That you will pardon our sins. That this day, even in this sanctuary, in this place of worship, gathered together with our sisters and brothers in the faith, that you will renew and restore us. And so with your help, through the grace of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, enable us to live more faithfully as your servants, to bring honor, praise, and glory to the name of Jesus Christ, through whom we offer this our prayer. Amen. Our second hymn from the church hymnary is number 546. It focuses on the theme that we're following today, which is around the subject of prayer. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, unuttered or expressed, sometimes just quietly in our hearts, other times in the public place. The motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. This very beautifully written hymn, some terrific lyrics in it that express the, the ups and downs, the ins and outs of our prayer life.
perhaps James Montgomery was reading the two parables of Jesus from Luke's gospel that we're about to share in when he penned these words in verse 4, prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, our watchword at the gates of death, we enter heaven with prayer. We say as we sing these words something of the huge importance that prayer has to us in our lives. We can't go very long at all without breathing. It ought to be the same in terms of a shared prayer relationship with God our Father. Luke chapter 18 and verses 1 to 14 is our scripture for this morning. As I say, Jesus tells two parables in the course of these 14 verses. First, the parable of the persistent widow, and then the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I suspect that both of these stories are very well known indeed, but that doesn't mean to say that we ought not to pay attention when they are being read when we're reading them together, because God always has something new to say to us from his word. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Then to some who were confident of their own righteousness, and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. We thank God for this reading from his word. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Probably one of the best known hymns on the theme of prayer. It's number 547 in the church hymnary.
let's just do that very thing. Let's pray together, shall we? God, our Father, we come to you in prayer to ask you to teach us to pray, to teach us to do better that which is important to us, but can be so much more valuable, so much more precious still. And so help us to listen, to hear, and to discern your voice speaking to us through your word now. For this we pray in the name of the one who exemplified a life of prayer, even Jesus our Savior. Amen. <coughs> For many, the examination season is now over, and I'm sure that some people feel like jumping up and down and shouting hallelujah. I know that Matthew at the technical desk at the back feels like that. We had that discussion on his way in this morning. I remember well sitting exams at different stages in my own life. School, I was exposed to my very first really proper formal examination, my O-grade English, on my 16th birthday. What a way to celebrate your birthday. There I was sitting, and for about the first 10 minutes, when I turned the paper over, my hands were shaking so much that I couldn't write a single thing. I was just so very nervous. But as time goes on, I suppose you get into a way of doing examinations, you get a bit better at them, a bit more practiced in them. And by the time I got on through my first degree at university, studying chemistry at Stirling University, then I felt fairly confident. I spent five years teaching that subject to others in the Berwickshire High School, in Duns and the Scottish Borders, and presenting them for exams. And I think I was about as nervous presenting other folk for exams as I was sitting them myself, because you wanted these youngsters to do their very best, to show the potential that you knew that they had within them. And then on to New College at Edinburgh University, the Faculty of Divinity there, where I studied to train for the Church of Scotland ministry. And I remember my very last day of examinations at New College. I remember how energetic and enthusiastic and ebullient I felt as I came out of the exam room and I bounded into the library, which normally was supposed to be a place of silence, as you can imagine. And I saw some of my friends sitting there who still had an exam to sit, and I was finished. And I smiled at them, and I turned on my heel, and as I walked out the library, I shouted back, I'll be thinking about you. To which one of my dear friends, Alan Reed, who's the minister now in Kinross Parish Church, shouted back, I, Derek, think about us with a capital P. And so often, glibly, we will say to people, I'm thinking about you. If they're going through a difficult time, if they're facing something that's really hard, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. Do they know that what we really mean is that we're thinking about them with a capital P? And what do we mean by that? Not only are we thinking about them, not only are they in our thoughts, but they're in our prayers as well. And that's what Alan meant that day. Very sincerely and genuinely, he said, pray for me, because I've still got this examination to go through. Luke chapter 18 brings this first section of five studies in the parables of Jesus to a close. But by the way, there's another five uh, studies in the parables to come because Jesus told a whole lot of parables, tremendous stories that help us to learn lessons that we need to learn for our spiritual development and welfare. But today in Luke 18, we actually get two for the price of one. It's what Asda and the other supermarkets sometimes refer to as a bog-off deal. They're not being rude. It stands for <laughs> buy one, get one free. Well, we didn't pay for the first one, so that's okay. Two parables, but one subject. They're both 
about prayer. Verses 1 to 8 focuses on the first parable, the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. And verses 9 to 14 focuses on that contrast between the one who was full of himself and the other who came before God beating his breast, the tax collector. Jesus doesn't often make the purpose or the theme of his parable just as obvious as he does here in verse 1. He says that the purpose of prayer, the purpose of this parable is to pray and not give up. In other words, as someone else has put it, to push. P-U-S-H is an acronym for pray until something happens. And we'll come back to that just in a moment. But first of all, I want to think with you about the two main characters who appear in this parable. There's the judge, who is described as someone who doesn't fear God and who has no favor towards people. Can you imagine that? There's the widow, who is probably one of the most defenseless and vulnerable people in the society of that day. She comes to the judge seeking restorative justice. The judge himself, in not fearing God and having no care or concern for people, really, in a sense, is not fit or qualified to be a judge in Hebrew society. Because if you don't fear God, then of course you're not going to concern yourself about the welfare of people. And if you don't concern yourself about the welfare of people, then you're already showing that you have no fear or indeed love of God. But this judge was in a position of honor, a position of power, a position of responsibility. He could lord it over the people in his community. Whereas the widow was in the opposite situation. She had very few options open to her. She could try to bribe the judge by giving him a backhander. She could perhaps threaten him. Although I don't know what threat would ever have worked against someone in such a position as this judge. Or she could cast herself down before him and simply plea. That's what she did. And the judge says, as the parable goes on, that he literally had to grant her plea because he was going to be worn out if he didn't. The phrase that she would wear me out also could be translated, translated that she would blacken my eye. He was punch drunk by this woman coming again and again and again. She came to him in court. She came to his home. Probably when he was out doing his shopping, she was the one standing next to him in the queue at whatever the equivalent of the supermarket was in those days, she was very persistent indeed. She persevered. So the lesson, of course, from this parable is that we have to persevere and to nag God until He will answer our prayers. No, that's not the lesson of this parable. Because Jesus said at the beginning that we had to pray and not give up. But that doesn't mean to say that God is unwilling to answer our prayers. Or that we need to somehow twist His arm up His back in order to have Him answer our prayers. In fact, that would be a perverted view of God and of us and of prayer if we were to take that attitude or that understanding from this 
parable. Jesus, I think, gave us this parable to act as something of a spur. Yes, to go on praying, but to know that the one to whom we pray is precisely the opposite of the judge mentioned in this parable. God is not only good in His actions, God is inherently good in His nature. We're told later on in the New Testament, in the first letter of John, that God is love and that God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. So if your view of God when you're coming to Him in prayer is that somehow you've got to change His mind by your persistence, by your nagging, then you've got the wrong image of God. God, as Jesus put it very clearly in teaching His followers to pray, is our Father in heaven. So it's not the case that we should have the thought that if we just prayed longer, or we lived better lives, or we had more faith, that God would always answer our prayers according to what we want. Actually, what that is to do is to set up a theology of meritocracy. In other words, that you somehow merit, you deserve God answering your prayers, and especially in the way that you want them to be answered. Let me tell you, none of us earns an answer to our prayers from God, unlike the judge who eventually did give justice to the woman because of her persistence. God is more than willing to answer our prayers and knows what we need even before we ask Him. He loves us and wants what is best for us at all times. Think about the persistence of the Apostle Paul when he describes how he has a thorn in his flesh. Now, we're not entirely sure what that thorn in the flesh was. There have been various suggestions about it over the years, one of which was that when he was blinded on the Damascus road as a result of meeting the resurrection, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, that somehow, even when the scales fell from his eyes, that he retained a problem with his eyesight. And there is some evidence for that in Scripture elsewhere. We don't know. That might have been a storm in the flesh. We can't be certain. But he prayed three times that God would remove his thorn in the flesh. Did God do that? He did not. So what did Paul get in answer to his prayers? More grace. An abundance of grace to be able to deal with whatever it was that was his thorn in the flesh. And indeed, that's one of the purposes of prayer and persisting in prayer. It's to know that connectedness to God between father and child to sense his love for us and to believe and to grow in faith that no matter what the answer to the situation we face and that we're praying about is, it will be what's best for us. It might not be what we like. It might not be what we would choose. But it will be what is best for us. Because God sees things from a hugely different perspective to the way that we see life. And so who are we to come and say, God, we know better? We do not. Persisting in prayer is about developing that relationship with God as our Father. It's also about learning more to trust Him and to show our dependence upon him. Philip Yancey, the great Christian writer of our day who's written a huge number of books, all of which are worth reading if you ever get a chance, said prayer is a declaration 
of dependence upon God. We usually expect from an American to hear the word independence come after that word declaration. But in this case, it's reversed. In fact, a prayerless life, a life where we never pray, is a declaration of independence from God. But a life where we come constantly to God. And by the way, He will not be bugged even when we do repeat things. When we bring these things to Him, we are expressing our dependence, our trust, our belief that as a loving Heavenly Father rather than an unjust judge, He will bless us with what is best for us. And then Jesus goes on to the second parable in verses 9 through 14. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was quoting from a commentary that I've been using to read through Luke's gospel, which is written by the pastor emeritus from one of the churches I visited when I was in Chicago a few years ago, a man called Kent Hughes. And Kent Hughes describes the second parable wonderfully. He says, it is a comfortable old slipper that other people wear. I'll repeat that because you really need to think about it. It is a comfortable old slipper that other people wear. There's something very familiar about this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's so familiar that we fail to be shocked by it in the 21st century because we think that we, we know it, we know what it means, we understand it fully. But when it was first told, it was far from being a comfortable old slipper. Sometimes slippers can be things that can be less than comfortable. When I was a young lad, as I've told you, um, there were occasions, just odd occasions, not very often, when I was kind of naughty. On one of those occasions, my dad had given me, I can't remember for a Christmas or a birthday, a wee carpenter's tool set. Now, my dad was a joiner to trade, and he'd given me what was just a cut-down version of a proper man's toolkit. In those days, you didn't get the plastic stuff, you know. You got the real thing. You got a real hammer. You got a real screwdriver. And you got a real saw. And shortly after I received that gift, my mother caught me from across the room trying to saw the leg off her display cabinet with her wedding china in it. It was a glass display cabinet, lots of glass. How do I know there was lots of glass? Because when she took off her slipper to throw it at me <laughs> and missed, me at least, but hit the glass, there was a lot of glass. When Jesus told this parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector, he didn't give us a pair of old comfortable slippers to put on. He chucked a slipper at us to wake us up and to say, Pay attention, church. This is important. This parable was shocking in the day and age that it was told. Initially, it starts off great, presenting an image of a Pharisee who's praying in the temple to God. It's all so terrific. It sounds so spiritual and so religious. Here he is, a member of the establishment. Everybody should be really impressed by the fact that he gives to the poor, that he prays regularly. And of course, everybody expects the tax collector to be the dud in the story. The Pharisee is the hero. Initially, when this story is told, the tax collector, he's no friend to the ordinary Jewish man or woman in the street. In fact, a tax collector in today's society, well, tax collectors are very responsible people in today's society. We do have a few people in the congregation who work with the inland revenue. He says, quickly digging himself out of a hole. A tax collector in their society in the first century would be equivalent to like a drug dealer in today's society. Somebody who's out to just grasp and get what they can 
for themselves. So the Pharisee was someone who was seen as praying for people, and the tax collector was seen as someone who prayed upon people. And you need to get that into your head. And then Jesus puts these prayers into their mouths in this parable. And the Pharisee commits the cardinal sin. Not only does he boast about himself in his prayer, it's about me, 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 I, 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 but he compares himself to this tax collector. Thank goodness I'm not like him, he says. Well, the tax collector focuses on himself as well, but he focuses on himself as a sinner, as a failure, as someone who's come short of what God requires. In seven simple words, he reveals his heart. His heart is dark, but it's soft. It's repentant. Forgive me. That's what he's looking for. Mercy, pardon, liberty, freedom from this burden that's weighing down upon him from all the wrong that he's done in his life. Whereas the Pharisee, the religious establishment guy, he not only announces his own virtues, he also proclaims the sins of the person next to him. Now let me tell you, and some of you have heard me this, say this before, whenever you compare yourself with somebody, you will either feel superior to them or you will feel inferior to them. It doesn't matter what the result is. Superiority or inferiority, they're both damaging. And I believe that's one of the things which Jesus is really being critical of here in the Pharisee's prayer. And whether it's in prayer or whether it's just in general conversation, when you're up the street on Monday to Friday, if you're starting to compare yourself with somebody else and you, you feel good about that because you think, oh, well, I'm doing a better job than they are. Or you compare yourself and you think, hmm, I wish I was them. Then you're going down the wrong road. The one you need to compare yourself to is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the tax collector did. He realized that he didn't come up to God's perfect standards and he said so. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That is a good place to be in all our prayer lives. It drives us to our knees. And the meaning of this second parable is made plain in the final verse we read this morning, where Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, they'll be brought down. And those who humble themselves, those who are the servant of the lowest of the least, will be exalted. This is actually, for us as a Reformed church, really important because this is about prayer which focuses on justification by faith and not by works. The Reformers had a saying, sola fide, by faith alone. Don't expect God to be impressed by your holiness. That's what the Pharisee thought would happen, that if he came to God and he told him about all the good things that he did and the life that he lived, that God would somehow be impressed and grant his prayer. That's not the kind of prayer that God is looking for. He is looking for a prayer which comes from a soft heart, a humble heart. So we have these two parables on prayer. There's a huge amount in there that I encourage you to go away and read again for yourself. The first parable reveals what we think about God. Do we think of him as being like an unjust judge? Somebody that sits on his throne and is delighted to throw bolts of lightning down at people? Or do we think of him as, as our Father in heaven who longs to hear our prayers, to commune with us day by day, and to answer our prayers with what's best for us. And then there's the second parable, which focuses on what we think about ourselves. Who do we really think we are? Do we think we're good enough? 
as the Pharisee did? Or do we come with a humble heart, knowing how far short of what we ought to be we have fallen? Amen. We continue to bring our worship to God as our morning offering is now given and received. <laughs>
Wasn't that beautiful to listen to the choir sing that piece? That was just tremendous. Thank you for that. We always spend some time not only dedicating our offering, but praying for others in the world, and um, we we will do that this morning. Um, We welcome at the beginning everyone who joins us online, and Anthony Short, who's our missionary partner, almost always every Sunday morning joins us online, and he just sent us a message um, this morning saying, good morning from Jaffa. Glad to be able to join you today. Please pray for the school Uh, We are facing a difficult situation at the moment, so we will certainly remember uh, Tabitha School in our prayers this morning. Let us pray. Lord, you have blessed us beyond our deserving. You have given us more than we could ever have dared to ask for, loving us with a love that refuses to count the cost sharing us with good things which are too many to number. Gracious God, for your generous and wonderful gifts, we praise you, and we bring this our offering as a token of our thanks. But we also want to spend some moments together praying for our world, the world which you created, the world which you loved so much that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for it. We pray for all of those who are weighed down by the stresses and strains of daily life, those who long for peace of mind, who crave rest for their souls but cannot find it. We pray for those oppressed by worry and unable to throw off anxiety held captive by a multitude of fears. We pray for those who cannot let go, those who find it impossible to relax or unwind, who are always fretting over this or that. We pray also for those who lose themselves in the busyness of modern life, which often masks their true feelings and leaves them running on empty We pray for those who have lost time for you, who have allowed the pressures and demands of each day to shut you out, putting any thought of you off until tomorrow. We pray that we and all like us who seek to follow Christ will spend more time each day in your presence being thankful, being grateful for all of the ways in which you bless our lives. And Lord, this day as we've heard from Anthony over there in Israel, we pray in particular for him as the principal of the school at Tabitha, for the staff, for the students, for the parents and families in the wider community that you will bring peace. Living God, speak to each one of us and to all who cry out to you. Let us hear your still, small voice. Grant us your peace which passes understanding, a quiet confidence in your purposes, so that our burdens may be lifted and our souls refreshed. Lord, In your mercy, hear our prayer, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. A great, a powerful, and a strong hymn with which to finish this morning, number 515 from the hymn book, Soldiers of Christ Arise. This is about the armor of God, and of course, we are called to put on each piece with prayer.
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, now and forevermore. Thank you.